You'll excuse me, I'm not going to stand throughout the talk. I have a hope factory. 23 years ago, while serving in the Army, I had a severe back injury. Um, I had two back surgeries trying to fix it and uh, finished up partially paralyzed. At the beginning of my disability, I used to jump for short distances using crutches and use the wheelchair for longer ones. Ten years ago, I had a major surgery to my right shoulder. During the surgery, they used anesthesia to prevent pain to the main nerve of the right arm, the brachial plexus. The anesthesia caused damage to, the, to that main nerve, and I left the surgery, I left the hospital with, the, with my right arm totally paralyzed. It took two long years of intense physical therapy to get my hand to the state in which it is now. I can cook for my kids, I can help them get dressed, I can wash them. The main loss I suffered was that as soon as I put full body weight on my arms, my elbow collapses and I fall, which is a bit of a problem when you're using crutches. So for the past 10 years, I didn't walk. When you think about disability, you can try thinking about the type of disability someone has. For example, if I said someone is a leg amputee, if the amputation is above the knee or below the knee to a human being who has never suffered any injury, it sounds like the same idea. It's an amputation. But these are two very different injuries because a below the knee amputation, you need a stump to get better, you get a prosthesis, you learn how to use it, and you get to your life back. Whereas an above the knee amputation, the stump needs repairing every few years, the prosthesis is very heavy, the walking is very inefficient, and it appears that the most important structure of the leg is the knee. But most people don't know it. I was injured when I was 19. Three years ago was my 20th anniversary. The first time I was disabled, longer than I was able-bodied. And I sat with my mom at her living room. We were thinking, we were discussing what happened throughout these 20 years. And I shared with her that while I was in the hospital, I was hospitalized for about three years. While I was in the hospital, I wasn't allowed to move, I wasn't allowed to sit, I was lying in bed. And what kept me sane throughout that time was when she came for a visit. And again, I wasn't allowed to move, so I recognized her by sound. I would hear the swoosh of the elevator doors opening. Then I would hear the of her high heel shoes. She would always wear high heels, and I recognized her rhythm. Then would come this wave of perfume. She always wears the same perfume. Then this huge, big, red smile with a hello. And she would do stuff with me. She would take me down with the bed, with me in it, and run at the hospital garden, pushing me in the bed so I could feel like I was still moving. Or bring my younger brother and sister along. She even brought my dog to jump on my bed. Let me feel like I was still a part of the living world. So when you think about disability, when you think about someone's coming to terms with their disability, you have to think about the families coming to terms as well. Because I was injured 23 years ago, but I think my, my disability is harder on my mom than it is on me. And now that I'm a mother, I can understand that. I have twins. They're eight years old. I also have uh, five and a half year old twins. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and the, uh, <laughs> and they're all boys. <laughs> I was always a very athletic child. I used to run. I used to ride bicycle. I played basketball. I played tennis. Um, but after I was injured, the only sports I could keep on doing was swimming. Because think of the worst case scenario. It's going to happen, I'm going to fall. Believe you me, in the water, it hurts much less than it does outside. 
So I used to come to the swimming pool in Beit HaLochem and swim my two to three kilometers. And one day, one of the swimmers there saw me from the Paralympic, from the Israeli Paralympic team saw me and he said, well, you swim nicely, come swim with us at the Paralympic team. And I came and the coach saw me and I guess he saw some potential. And we started training and two days on, I told him, well, the Olympic Games are four and a half years ahead. Well, I'd like a gold medal at the next Paralympic Games. <laughs> at Sydney 2000, I, I left with uh, three gold medals and three world records. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I participated in Sydney, I, I've been to, to Athens, I went to Beijing. I have seven Paralympic medals. London was supposed to be my last Paralympic Games. I was supposed to sit on the podium with my children on my lap and have my closing ceremony for a wonderful swimming career. But at the Paralympic year, I was injured at the hip. I laid in bed for 10 months and by that, four years of training flew out the window and my Paralympic closure was gone. And I was really disturbed. I was really disturbed I, because I really, I really wanted my ta-da! <laughs> so I thought, what else could I do to have my closing thing? And I decided I want to cross the English Channel. The English Channel is a very big body of water between England and France. It's very wide, approximately 40 kilometers wide. The water is very cold, roughly 16 degrees Celsius. Till now, 300, about 350 people crossed the English Channel. For compression, on the Everest, climbed around 5,200. So it's tough. <laughs> so I started training and my coach said that he estimates the swimming time is gonna be about 17 hours. To swim 17 hours, you need to be very aerobically fit. You have to be very mentally fit. And from the state I am in now, you have to gain about 20 kilos of fat that will be evenly distributed throughout my body, which is what every woman wants. <laughs> and, I <laughs> and to do that, he sent me to, to start doing Pilates. Pilates is a method of training that uses beds and springs and helps, the movement, helps to facilitate the movement to where you want to get. I started practicing Pilates twice a week, like a normal human being does. Quite quickly, I got to train five to six hours a day. <laughs> and after six months of training, I felt that my stomach, my belly, that is paralyzed from the belly button down because of the injury, and that is very weak because of the two huge, huge pregnancies I carried. <laughs> really, huge. Anyways, I felt that my stomach was getting a bit stronger and I could support myself in the wheelchair a bit better. I could sit more upright, I could move the chair a bit more easily. So I told my teacher, well, we're changing direction. The aim now is not crossing the English Channel, the aim is to walk again. And she looked at me as if I was crazy, which is something I'm kind of used to by now. <laughs> and sent me to another teacher because she said it's a bit too much for her. And she sent me to Hadar Schwartz. She's one of the most competent Pilates teachers in the world. Um, and we were training very, very, very much every day. I was training for five hours for almost two years. And I think it's gonna be easier for me to show you what I do instead of explaining, explaining it because I'm standing now on abdominal support only. I don't, I don't feel my legs. To know where I stand, I have to look down, and then I know where my feet touch the ground, and then I know where I am. Adal says you're looking at a floating human being. <laughs> when I wanna walk, I start by thinking which direction I wanna walk to. I'll walk to the left side because of the table here. When I wanna walk, I collect my belly higher up, I inhale and widen the diaphragm. 
from widening the diaphragm, I widen the pelvic floor. I'm going to the left, so I have to move with my right, my le right leg first. So I send the left crutch forward, collect my belly inwards, inwards and upwards. Inhale, and the leg moves, <laughs> which is... <laughs> which is very cool. <laughs> Which is really cool, because if you think about it, I'm belly walking. <laughs> but it's also very cool, because I'll go down with my kids to the playground, playground downstairs, and Noam, who is now five years old, look, looks up to me and says, Mommy, I really, really like it when you're tall next to me. <laughs> and that's cool. <laughs> I spent those two very intensive years of work studying how to become a Pilates teacher. And together with my partner, Maya Pakvan, I opened a Pilates studio. We now have 350 people training with us. 50 of them are disabled. We opened the studio last September, eight months ago. Five of them are now walking. Wow. Yeah. Twelve more are on the way. <laughs> We're working with different variety of disabilities, either orthopedic, neurological, congenital. I want to share a story of one of my trainees. This is Shir. She is 19. She was born with CP. When she came, her head was sunk down. Her hands were held high. She now knows how to lift her head up, and how to lower her hands. And because she can lower her hands, she can now start training to use an electric wheelchair. So she might have some freedom she didn't have for the past 19 years. And I think... <laughs> and I think it's amazing. So you might say I'm a freak of nature, but I'm no longer the only one. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hope factory.